Okay, so here we are again, and uh, today we are going to continue <coughs> to analyze the possible need finding methods. Okay, uh, wasn't yesterday, wasn't Tuesday. Uh, we had a look at the observation methods, uh, some of the observation methods, okay, uh, for which uh, we try to gather information about how the user or potential user is performing the current tasks uh, by interfering as less as possible uh, with their uh, activities and their action, actually. Okay, so we wanted to understand how the, situation, the current situation is uh, in a given context. Hmm? Uh, this gives some, some information okay, that we can use to identify you know, possible gaps some functions or some facilities that are missing or possible improvement points, okay? Sometimes that uh, some features or some functionality that are currently implemented but not in the best of, of the ways uh, because you see people that uh, are trying to take shortcuts uh, or uh, not the, let's say, the best uh, or the simplest path, okay? Observation can only observe uh, the current status. So it doesn't give us information about uh, possible new features, possible new applications, possible new uh, uh, um, devices uh, or, or whatever, okay? Uh, for doing that, we need to speculate a bit more with the users, okay? Trying to understand better what if, uh, what would happen if we had uh, uh, something new and for that we need to more to have more let's say interaction but then just uh, by observation okay and so uh, usually the first step is always observation just to get an idea a good idea of what the current situation is and then we need to to dig deeper hmm? uh, for example through other methods that are surveys uh, interviews uh, focus groups and so on uh, so Today, we'll discuss these two of these methods uh, where we actually have a conversation with the users about uh, the, how to help them in, uh, in a given domain, okay? So it may be something they are already doing, it may be something they could be doing, uh, as long as they are in the target group of users, uh, uh, we can do that. And let's start with the uh, so-called interviewing, asking, uh, the subtitle here is asking users about their needs uh, and desires. And the reality check is uh, what could possibly go wrong if I ask uh, somebody else what they want, okay? If I ask uh, any of you what you want, you know, on the website of the Polytechnico, I would, well, probably I would not get 70 different answers, but at least 30, yes. And uh, probably many of them will be in conflict, uh, and it's possible that many of them won't really solve any real problem, but it's just your, uh, your personal preference uh, or just something that uh, you stumbled upon yesterday, and so today it is the problem because yesterday it, you, you, you had an issue with that. Hmm? So it's very dangerous to ask this question directly. What do you need and what do you want? We should always avoid asking the direct question, okay? Because the answer would be useless. So we need to find methods, okay, to structure an interview with people, with more than one person, maybe less than 70 to get uh, say useful information structured in a way where we can actually use the information we get okay the issue is not that people will not respond or whatever is that if the information we have is not uh, practically usable uh, it doesn't help us in designing the feature of the new system okay um, in the broad topic of interviews, usually we, we say separate two different categories. Uh, 
surveys or properly interviews or direct in-person interviews. With uh, surveys, we try to get, uh, our goal is to get uh, um, in touch with a lot of people, hmm? large numbers of people. And so we have a standardized set of questions and we submit this question to the largest possible um, set of potential users. Hmm? So uh, you may, or we are all familiar with the uh, uh, online surveys. Hmm? Every now and then people always submit surveys to you and need to, okay, what do you think about that? Or paper surveys also, they were popular more in the past, uh, we're ticking some boxes and so on. And of course, if we are uh, targeting a large number, a large population, um, the kind of answers should be in a way more standardized. So I cannot ask, uh, you know, 2,000 people to write an essay, a poem, or a long text about what they want, because then I, I wouldn't be able to process all of that text, all that information. So they would be more, let's say, uh, schematic, more standardized. We'll come to sur the surveys in a second step. First, uh, we'll, uh, we'll analyze the, the simpler way, which is uh, direct interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of uh, making a survey across maybe 70 people that are in this room, uh, I will select 10 of you, or five, and dedicate 20 minutes half an hour to each of you huh? and uh, uh, having a conversation a structured conversation we should follow some some template uh, so that the information we get uh, can be analyzed uh, later on okay and so it's more time demanding because I need to sit with each of you and discuss and uh, uh, so the number of people that I can reach, uh, which me will be much more limited uh, in the order of units or tens of people, not surely not hundreds or thousands, okay, with this method. But of course, uh, I will get more information hmm, because uh, it will not just be some checking some boxes, but actually motivating the answers and understanding the motivations, okay. Uh, we may have interviews that are more structured, so I have a list of questions and I will only ask those and will only accept uh, some, uh, let's say, standardized uh, uh, answer, or more info unstructured, where we're just having a conversation over the topic. And uh, this could be normally a one-to-one -one setting, so each, let's say, researcher We'll meet one person at a time and we'll follow uh, the, the set of questions or the set of topics that we want to touch. Or it may be a, a group interview, which is sometimes called as a focus group. Mm. With a group interview, it's more, tends more to be unstructured because the conversation should follow okay, the dynamics of the group uh, and uh, everybody should be able to express their point of view so you cannot force a group to follow a set of steps uh, because otherwise would be you would be missing the opportunity of people to to compare their views to each other okay so what they're called focus group actually are a form of in-person inter interviews where more people are being interviewed at the same time this is not for the goal of this is not to save time uh, but is to get uh, also information uh, from the comparison, you now for the, um, also sometimes from the arguing of different people that may, uh, let's say, um, discover different points of view on a given topic. Okay. Um, the the biggest risk of all these kind of activities, so interviewing, surveying the users, is that. Uh, uh, you can read this nice article, stop asking users what they want, okay? So, but we need to interview them, yeah, but not, the only question we should not ask, we should never ask is what do you want, okay? 
uh, because users don't know what they want actually they may know let's say subconsciously I have a feeling that something could be done better but how as I, as I wish I said a couple of classes ago uh, they are not designers they are not engineers so they maybe feel something missing but we cannot ask them to define what is the solution for them if they come up with with a solution it will not be a good one probably because they will be only focused on their immediate problem probably hmm? uh, so asking a rational question rationally from a rational point of view asking okay what do you want uh, will not give you any useful result or you risk following each and every people's favorite detail Oh, I would like this button to be larger. No, I would like this button to be on the left or whatever. Okay? No. We should not substitute design with uh, claiming. I, I want to this, I want that. It should not be driving our design choices. The design choices should be driven by the needs, not by the wants, huh? but the individual requests. People second point they will tend to tell you what they think you will like people try to be nice okay even uh, irrationally so if you're going to a person say okay I'm be I'm you know I coming from a startup which is building this kind of new revolutionary product uh, would you like it would you use it oh yes fantastic huh? they will always tell what they think you you want to know hmm? so it will not get it will like talking to a mirror okay uh, that you receive back the information that you give to them and unless you be, you are careful not to do that okay so these are the risks we can avoid these risks but we need to structure the interview be very careful with kind of with the kind of questions we are going to ask hmm? and this is especially true for something that uh, is new to the user okay and uh, think of any let's say new technology or technology that we are now more or less familiar but a couple of years or five years ago was new hmm? I don't know the virtual reality biases okay uh, it's very difficult if you are never experienced that to give your opinions uh, about how how it works uh, or what you would like to do or what you in which way you prefer some or you find more useful some some application and so on okay so it's very different uh, to be asking to a person some information about a technology or a system or a workflow they already know compared to something that they never used hmm? and maybe you as a researchers already know the technology but the users don't hmm? and uh, so it will be more difficult uh, if you can let them try the technology okay but otherwise you, you must work uh, you know in a more indirect way hmm? uh, because for them it's something that they cannot imagine and it, it would be difficult to imagine also for the people that already are working on it huh? if they if it's something new so uh, in uh, new products uh, this initial phase uh, is more driven by the researcher let's say by the designer and less by the user we should more understand uh, we should understand more the, the needs of the user and we try to and we will propose uh, a new technology or new device uh, that we think uh, it fills the needs uh, and we only only in a second stage we will actually check uh, whether this need is fulfilled why for more consolidated technologies it's easy even at the beginning already to have a feeling uh, whether something um, is appreciated or useful to the users um, and the last point here is uh, again for for users they 
they take the current uh, mode of operation as the normal or as the only way of doing things. I are, I'm doing this task every day. In some way, I've optimized my actions for this task. Even if it's not the real optimal solution, it could be done better. I, myself, I reached a local optimum. Okay, I know how to do that. I know it requires uh, 72 steps instead of maybe only three, but now I know that by, by heart, uh, I don't think about them anymore. I'm quite quick and fast and don't make many mistakes at it. Because, because yes, this is the way things are, going to, are, are, are being. So a user takes uh, the context for granted. Okay, if this door is hard to push, you just learn to push harder. That's the way it is. As a user of the door, you don't start arguing and trying to redesign it uh, or to uh, lubricate it or whatever. But, okay, just push harder. This is my solution, my local solution. So if somebody asks you, maybe you would require a bigger handle to push better. Not maybe a lighter door to be opened or an automatic door or something else. Because you try to make your local optimum still better. But you don't see, as a user, other ways of designing not the door, the functionality of crossing the space, for example, in a different way. Mm? So, if the users are myopical, slightly blind, they don't see the potentialities, in our interview project we should be aware of that and not be trapped in the same short-sighted view that the users have, okay? Users are not stupid, okay? I'm not saying this. They are expert, at their own life, at their own domain. They are not experts at designing new systems. That's not their job. Hmm? And so we should get the information about what they, re what they know better than us, their domain, their activities, and we should do, put the, the information about what we should are supposedly better at doing, that is designing. Hmm? Okay, uh, so the first step, uh, to organize this interview, so uh, interviews sh sh might make look at simple things. Okay, let's go over for a coffee and have a, a chat about uh, something. But actually, with all these warnings, we should be say careful, uh, have a good method. First of all, who should I interview? The users, Pot real users, actual users, or potential users. The more in the target, the better. Okay. So not someone who pretends to be, but somebody who is actually one possible user. That tomorrow would, would sign in and would use my application. Uh, in some cases, you would also, let's say, widen your scope and interview also some stakeholders, okay? In this context, we define a stakeholder as a person who bears some interest in the success of the project. So maybe it's not uh, a real user, but it's somebody that if the users use the new product, uh, they will benefit in some way. Okay, benefit from the point of view of the productivity, from the point of view of you know, the economics uh, or whatever. Hmm? So sometimes uh, you may, we may include a side view of something which would be happy if the project is a success. Of course, they won't be the real users, so their information is not uh, so important as that uh, coming for the real users that we interview. So, remember, um, yesterday we said, uh, first, uh, know your users. Okay, we knew, uh, we defined who the target users are, whether there are some groups, and we should select some representative users from each of the groups, maybe plus some stakeholders. Um, if
if the system doesn't exist yet, uh, you can pick somebody maybe which is familiar with a similar system. Okay, so uh, maybe somebody is using a competitor's product uh, or something like that. So at least somebody with, with uh, already has an idea no, about uh, what we are talking about. Hmm? Um, of course, uh, if your product is new, there would not be any trained users or familiar users, uh, so you will pick uh, new ones. Uh, of course, uh, your questions or your interview will be less specific, of course, because there's less familiarity. Hmm? But try in a some, always not to say approximate. So finding somebody who works or knows something similar to the domain where you're working. Hmm? Uh, we cannot be extra precise here because at this stage, we should be careful not to have uh, an already defined list of features for the system, okay? So uh, our goal here is to explore which features are more important for them. So let's, don't try, this is a risk uh, for you, don't try to plan an interview to, with the goal of confirming the choices that you already made. Um, if somebody asks you, oh, would you, for example, okay, would you want to add, uh, you know, a chat functionality inside the application of the Polytechnico? Okay, this is a, a wrong question. Because it means that somebody already had one solution in mind. I integrate into an application a chat functionality and I'm asking you if you like it, okay? Usually would say, yes, why not? It doesn't cost anything to say yes. Maybe you want to use it, maybe you will. But uh, if we are talking about this feature, we don't know what is the purpose. Why do we find uh, it useful? And if we know, if we don't know why, or the content which is used uh, will probably not be designed correctly. Just a couple of examples uh, on, on this, this chat. Is this something for private chat among students? Free topics? Is this something for, uh, say, interacting with the professor of a course? So it should be divided into the different courses uh, and. Uh, in each course, you can discuss with your colleagues and with your professor. Is it something for giving, uh, you know, general uh, advice or, you know, like the ticketing, uh, but more informal? Who should have the right to see, to write, to read? And it all depends on the function. Why do we need that? It's not whether do you want it. That's not a good question is is there a need for a form of communication which is maybe faster or more informal and if so which is this kind of communication what are we trying to substitute are we trying to substitute maybe the 10 minutes after the class where people come to the teacher and ask questions maybe are we trying to substitute uh, you know the uh, the messages that the teacher is sending, so actually it would be a, a read-only chat, maybe. There are different needs, and according to the needs, you will implement a different functionality. And uh, this is if we, are, if we are thinking about a specific project. Okay, so maybe you have an idea, oh, about chat uh, functionalities. Okay, but before talking about the functionalities, we should investigate about the needs. And then we can do the design. Okay? Uh, maybe we are designing something very carefully, very nice, uh, very good looking. It doesn't crash. Maybe. Um, but uh, maybe there's a, good, a huge potential, which is maybe uh, new students. 
students coming from other universities they want to have information so while you are already a student you have a lot of information already and a lot of connections if you are trying to plan you know, each of you try to plan to to enroll to a different university and you don't know who to ask or what to or where to go okay and, and so that would be this is just an example of course that would be a bigger let's say uh, need which is not covered by any current functionality that could be covered by this but we are talking about something which is open to non-students instead of something that should be close to each course student so I what I'm trying to say is that a given functionality a chat could be implemented in a hundred different ways and each different way will serve or will cover a different need some of these needs are real some are just in my imagination it could be possible that somebody wants that and then you go and go and implement a lot of stuff and then you find out that nobody actually cares to use it because it was a need just sitting in your mind and not a need coming from the people so okay it's very I'm, I'm just repeating these kind of examples but because it's difficult for us to change our mind we have a good idea okay let's keep it there and try to understand where this good idea would would fit into real needs of some real population and then we can develop the, the details just to finish this example about the chat if you imagine for example how many options you have in an application like uh, like telegram for example the option for private public uh, uh, who can share what uh, and uh, the configuration uh, there are maybe okay the core functionality is writing messages but behind that there are probably 20 or more settings uh, if you are creating a group or a channel that help you customize the behavior of the application to the specific need that you have that is uh, trying to be generalistic and letting your users customize the, the application to fit their need. Here we are trying to do something more, say, custom. Identifying the needs and building uh, or identifying the functionalities that are useful. Okay? It's a different, if you are targeting huge populations, of course, uh, you need uh, to let the user configure different, uh, be, be more flexible towards the users. If you have a smaller population, you can go deeper and select better. Um, okay, so I, I, it was a small digression, but before uh, uh, meeting with the users, we should clear our mind from what we already decided to do. Hmm? Um, and the last point here is uh, uh, remember that the users are giving you their time they're investing some of their time with you and so you should give something back okay a small gift a coffee five euros a chocolate box whatever a smart watch no maybe for 20 minutes is too much maybe the surprise among all the people who have been interviewed so you have uh, a raffle that uh, just select randomly a, a winner whatever okay People should feel they have something back. They are not wasting their time on you. They are not uh, paying for your research. Uh, we are doing product research, actually. And so product research should, be <laughs> should come from the budget uh, of the owner of the product. OK? Um, when I spent some time but no, you are a, a phone call every now and then. Oh, can we do a survey? Okay, so I'm using my time to re, to to give you information that you will use to build a product and sell it to me. Okay, so later on I will pay for a product that I will help. So it's not. So people should feel compensated. Otherwise, if they don't feel say compensated even slightly, okay, we we don't need the, to to give them. 50 euros uh, if, if they don't feel compensated that would uh, probably more they are more likely to lie not to tell the truth okay um, and uh, 
they will be more than a rush. Okay, let's finish this. Hmm? Uh, and so always plan for of giving something back to them, hmm? even just a symbolic uh, gift or, or whatever. They are spending half an hour of their time with you. Okay, uh, so once we select the people, we should plan for the interview. So first of all, is planning. All engineering uh, is always 90% planning and 10% execution. Then this 10% will take maybe 200% of the time, but uh, the planning is always the important part. So where do we do the interview? Okay, maybe I want to stop people that are rushing to get a train in the station. No, because they are in a hurry and it's noisy, you don't know them, you don't have time to explain. So where and how uh, and when do we schedule it? Of course, it depends on the context, again. Okay. Maybe we are coming from a phase of observation, so we already know the behavior, when the people have, are more free time, which are the environments that are more quiet, okay? If you are interviewing something in the catering of a restaurant or a, or a bar, you won't go there at one o'clock because it's the rush hour for them. Maybe at three o'clock they are sitting down, they are taking some breath, and they are more I mean, uh, available for chatting or whatever. Hmm? So find a place that is comfortable for them, not for you, for them. Explain why you are there, okay? I need your help. You, do, you are not going there to sell a product. You are there to, for asking for their help in understanding, planning, designing your product. You are not, and this is the most important point, uh, you are not evaluating the users. You are not grading them. You are not saying, okay, you are a good user because you are, your uh, answers are right. The user's answers are always right because they are about themselves. So they, you cannot say, okay, this is not true or this is wrong because if I'm saying something about myself, by definition, it's right. It may be not true because maybe I'm, I'm convinced of something which is not true, but it's right to me, okay? So the, but the goal here is not assessing whether the user understands something. The goal is more to assess what the user understands. And so the user should be, okay, uh, um, let's say, have enough serenity to talk to you and knowing that you are not uh, judging them, you are not evaluating them, you are not scoring them, you are learning from them. I am testing my idea, I am not testing your responses, okay? And uh, it's always better to ask uh, with open questions, with wide questions, hmm? open-ended, so that people can tell what they want, uh, not, uh, not as uh, uh, long sequence of uh, um, strong questions. Hmm? That will be more for maybe a survey where you have a lot of check boxes to tick. But when you're talking to a person, okay, it's not a, a, a police questioning when you go there and uh, put a lamp on their face and start asking uh, uncomfortable questions. No, try to get in the mood of talking about a topic, okay? So how I don't know, how you find your way to the campus, for example? Or uh, how do you, if your goal would be ultimately to work, uh, for example, on the local mobility? I always start about a uh, question that are, where the users can, if you, are, if you start with a very wide question, they could answer anything. And that, this will give you the hint of what is the topic that is more painful for them. So if I'm asking, how do you move on campus? And they reply, yes, but the, the line for the, uh, for, the cafeteria, for the student cafeteria is very long. Okay, this is a pain, pain for, for them. They could have answered anything about uh, 
the number of bathrooms or the location of the classrooms or the parking spaces or whatever. They choose a point, they choose something to tell you. And you know that if they choose something, this is on the top of their mind. Hmm? Maybe it's only one user, but if you find that it's in some topic is on the top of the mind of many users, there you have your gold mine. Hmm? Um, questions should be unbiased, so the user should not be able to guess what you think about it. You should not try the user to give the response that you would like, and the user should not be able as much as possible to guess what is your preferred answer. Because otherwise, again, they would give you back your information and not give you their information. So all the questions should be non-leading. A leading question is a question that already contains the answer in that. Would you like to have the chat functionality? Yes, it's the only possible answer. If you are a user. And you are giving something, something more. Maybe I won't use it, but why should they be rude and tell you no? You are offering me something. I'm offering you a, a candy. Will you take it? Yes. Maybe you don't eat it because you don't trust me. But you get it just for being polite, for example. Okay. So the question should never already you know, put on the on the silver plate uh, the answer that you want. Otherwise, they are useless. Hmm? Um, ask you the question and uh, give them time to answer. I don't want a quick. Qu okay, a quick question can tell me what is on the top of their mind. But after the question, I should not uh, immediately move to the second one. Let's just let it sit there for 20 seconds of silence. Because people then will think about what they said and will add more. Will add more about that uh, or will add uh, uh, some other topic that didn't come to their mind first, but upon reflection, uh, it, it could be uh, important. So they should be free, you should feel free no? to, to add something. It's not the, the first response that counts like in uh, television quizzes. Uh, it's the whole of the answer. So uh, the second reply is often more interesting than the first, he says here. So let's not rush. We have maybe half an hour, we have 10 questions, five questions. Let's go through them. And uh, especially if, some, if people are not, uh, you know, communicative enough, somebody may be shy, somebody may be afraid you know, of telling you too much, follow up, okay? Oh, yes, the problem is really with, uh, you know, parking in the morning. Oh, tell me more about the parking. You just prompt them to go further, okay, so that they can explain you why this is a problem. Because maybe it's finding the place uh, or maybe it's the price they have to pay. So if they say the problem is the parking, it doesn't tell you what the real reason is. Okay, so should you work on the, you know, finding a, a spot or should you work on, uh, you know, some tariff uh, or uh, subscription that let you have a, a better price or whatever. No? There are diff totally different solutions and you only get them if you listen enough uh, to the problem of the user or to the say, explanation of the user. So if there are some point that you feel it's interesting, spend more time on those. Let people, always, let people talk. Okay, you should not, again, tell the user where to go. Um, Ah, the, the trouble is always the parking in the morning. And if you say, oh, yes, it's really difficult to find a spot, you are putting another, an answer in their mouth. They didn't say that. Okay, so your role is just to prompt and to get information. Or something like, oh, the, there are different problems like so funding places or Oh, yes, this is really, if you say, oh, yes, this is really interesting. So you are selecting for them. 
instead of them. Don't tell them that this is more interesting than that. Okay, in your mind, you are judging, you are filtering, uh, but you don't want to, uh, in this phase, uh, uh, tell them that some of their problems or their issues are more important than others, in your opinion. Hmm? So, the difficult part is having a nice conversation about a set of topics uh, and being sure that the content of the conversation will reflect their opinion and not yours. This is the bottom line. And we should be careful because we are really invested in our project. We like it. We are sure, we are convinced it's a great project. But it's not the goal. We are not trying to sell it or to convince other people. Um, so, Planning also means deciding which question to ask at the beginning, always in this flexible framework, but you should know the question so that you don't forget some important point. You don't forget to touch some important point. The question could be more structured. Hmm? Give me, tell me the three main points or the, the last three activities you did on that website, for example. Okay, there's a very specific structured question or uh, and it's easy they are easier to process because at the, at the end you have the list of items uh, to be maybe you may put them to, into a table count uh, so you uh, may have more quantitative information also if uh, maybe you are splitting the work of the interview so you have three or four different people doing interviews when they put together the results uh, it's easier to, to match them because the, the question has some, let's say, is not rigid, but at least uh, structured in the, in the format. Otherwise, uh, you may have more free, unstructured questions. So you bring up a topic and let them discuss it. And uh, in this case, you have more comments, uh, but of course, you will need to read and study them. It's, it's, uh, it's not so easy, let's say, to extract information from a set of, of responses. Again, it's a matter of maybe we could do some structured questions, some open ones. Um, in general, always try to, even if your question is, is a structured one, is a straight one, give me the three items, always leave some space for uh, follow-up discussion on that. So why do you say that? Why do you choose these three? Which is the most important about this? So always prompt them to add more information. Um, if you are asking quantitative questions, so on a scale one to five, how would you rate, uh, you know, how comfortable these chairs are? Hmm? You tell me two, you tell me three, one. And, but each of us has a different interpretation of a numerical scale. Okay, so there are people which are very you know, eager to give five stars to everything, and people for which uh, three stars is already an achievement. Right? Because we have our own internal scale. It depends on, on a lot of factors. I don't know if you already seen the, the meme that is circulating, the picture where uh, they compare different cultures about uh, the meaning of uh, good, pretty good, excellent, and so on. You see the people in the United States, uh, when they tell you, oh, it's excellent, excellent it's great, it really means it's uh, shit, or because they are you know, culturally <laughs> uh, always trying to start with a, with a high compliment, even if they, while maybe people in the UK say, oh, yeah, it's not too bad, when they really mean it's uh, fantastic, okay? So, uh, apart from, from these say, jokes, uh, I, you, you gave me three. What do you mean by three? What could be, the, be better? So just you understand, okay, this is a three, but actually it's a good uh, evaluation, or the three would be, mean, for, for me, is really bad, and so. But if, we, I, if I stop at the number, I won't understand the reason. So we are spending more time in interview just to get more information. Because if at the end uh, we are making an interview and we only get numbers, oh, okay, it, it would have been better to make it online and don't spend so much time. Hmm? 
sitting with the user asking concrete specific questions not okay you can start with uh, how are you doing today <laughs> okay but then uh, try to have questions where you ask the user to speak about the topic that you are interested in. Mm -hmm. always using the language of the user this one you already knew we should first learn the language of the user how the user calls things and not how your program or your technicians call things. Um, and uh, the last point, uh, we as computer engineers are already know that first you need to test and debug uh, your tools. And so also the, the interview should be tested and debugged. W how? With a smaller group of people, maybe some colleagues. So before setting up uh, for doing 20 interviews, out in the wild with real users, maybe pick three of your colleagues or your friends uh, and test the interview. Hmm? Then you throw away the results, you don't care. But while you were going through the interview with some trusted people, you maybe will find that some question is not so clear, or you are actually missing some question, or something is redundant. And so you are debugging, basically, okay? Um, it doesn't take much time for doing that uh, we, we do you do that with one or two people but then you are sure you're not throwing away the uh, larger amount of time where you go out uh, with uh, the other people hmm? these are some examples of uh, open-ended questions okay these are all questions where it's impossible to know what you think you are not driving the user, you are letting them the space for expressing themselves on a given topic. You decide the topic, they decide the content. Hmm? Uh, this one, the, the, what has gone wrong with the application is a bit, a bit loaded because it assumes that something went wrong. So you are telling them, okay, something should have gone wrong for sure. Tell me what. So it's a bit more, lo uh, it's loaded with a background of assumptions. No? But maybe you know that this is the case, so you want to, to improve something and something's already wrong. Okay. And we are not talk talking about errors. We are talking maybe about some, some, something difficult or whatever. And the last question is always, always remember to ask it. What else could I be asked? So what is the question we didn't ask and you want to tell us? Maybe they will tell nothing. But if they, if they tell you something, it's an opportunity for you to learn a point of view from the users, from the users that you didn't think about beforehand. Okay, so you can maybe, you may include new questions for, for the next user, if you see. So always give them the opportunity of course, you should work in a time box. Okay, so at the beginning, say, okay, we are going to, the, to do this for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and keep the time. Uh, so you, you should be you know, nice to the users, but you shouldn't be that prisoner. So they, they start talking and talking, just feel free to stop them. Okay, let's move to the next question. Okay, the interview is finished. Uh, I don't, I, want, I don't want to abuse of your time anymore, and so on. Okay, so try to close it. You don't want uh, 20 minutes to, to turn into two hours. There are some bad questions. This is the, the example of the chat. Is this feature important to you? The answer is invariably yes. Because there's no negative point in saying yes you're not trading off this feature with something else i'm asking you do one more yes uh, so what would you like this is a very open question but it's about the tool not about the user and so we are asking the user to design a functionality. It's not a job. Their answer is not useful. Okay? 
So what do you want to do? It's okay. What should the tool do? No. Always ask questions about their life, about their activities, about their preference, their issues, their pain points, and so on. Never about the technology. Remember, we forbid in this classroom to use any technological technology word until half of the course. Okay, we are talking about humans. Uh, what do you like or what do you dislike uh, about uh, a topic? So this is assuming that they actually like or they actually dislike the topic. It may not be true. So if I'm asking what do you like in this feature and uh, people will, a lot of people will want to respond to you nothing because it's totally crap, okay? They will try to find something they like because the question is uh, find something that you like. Hmm? So maybe it's more open if you say what your, what's your opinion, what's your evaluation of this feature? So the opinion would be positive or negative, okay? It's up to you to respond. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, what, what if I ask, uh, what you like more? Yes, yes, it's another way of, uh, uh, try to, uh, yes, al always f uh, phrase the question in a neutral way. Now, the trick is that the user should not be able to guess what you had in mind. Remember the, what was that, the queen of the Snow White uh, no? that went to the mirror, 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 which is the, uh, and she wanted a giving answer, that actually the answer wasn't that. But the mirror was honest. And this set up in motion a lot of uh, trouble for the, all the people involved, okay? Because the mirror was being honest and was, tell, was, tell, was telling the truth. Our <laughs> users will not be so rude to tell the truth in that way. So uh, I, I uh, you know, the, the people around the queen would have, tell, would have told the queen that she was the most beautiful one, okay? Um, okay, uh, what would you do if, this again brings us to the question of a new technology or, or, an, or a domain where the user is not so familiar? What would you like more for, you know, driving an helicopter? What do I know? More or less, I can drive the bicycle. So it's so unfamiliar to me that I cannot give any information. I, I will tell you something, of course, the first thing that comes to my mind. The weapons. And, uh, but, so, this is, if we are choosing the right users, maybe, okay, they will have more information, more valuable information about the topic. If we don't find good users, because as we said at the beginning, the technology or the product is new, uh, let's not push that too much. Okay, try maybe to ask questions about similar situations where they are familiar and, uh, um, you remember the uh, smart towers uh, that they shown in the, in the previous class uh, where there are all the switches on the wall. Uh, this is a, a, um, a situation where they asked for a lot of features, but they were asking to people who never tried that. And so they replied, yes, I want everything. Because if I don't know, I cannot make a choice. So always think whether the question you're doing is, an, is an, uh, about a domain that the user is really familiar with. And also, also quantitative questions are very difficult to get. We humans are very bad at numbers. How, how often do you check Instagram a day? Probably each of you can throw a number and this number will be off by orders, orders of magnitude. We don't know, basically. We, we guess something which is not true. So, oh, but by the way, 
this information is, easy to, is, is very easy to get uh, with a program, analytically, by analyzing the logs, by checking the application. So don't ask users for information that you can get by machines. Machines are very good at counting. They don't know why, they don't know what you're doing. Okay, you can ask people. So it's more of why are you checking Instagram or for what, uh, for chatting, for seeing, I don't know, rather than how many times. How many times is something that you can, you, you should find a different way of, of, of getting that information. If this information is important to you, find a different way. Don't ask users about uh, quantitative uh, uh, numbers of, uh, or questions, okay? And uh, very easy would be to ask binary questions, okay? yes or no. The problem is that the people would just respond yes or no. And then you don't know what they have in mind. Why did they respond with yes or no? So it's always more interesting the why than the what in this phase of, of design. Uh, so instead of, uh, would you like to have a button for opening the door, yes or not, maybe how would you like to open the door, and uh, they will tell you how. Mm -hmm. um, would you want, uh, you know, uh, the, an, an alarm in your phone, a notification about the next uh, classroom where you want to go? No. Why not? Because it would be uh, annoying, because you already have your calendar, because uh, you don't feel the need or whatever. So always, it's also always better to ask what about, what do you think about a given topic rather than do you want it or not or do you like it or not and so on. Always give space, we want to get motivation. This is about uh, interviews where we have a limited number of questions. We cannot do an interview with uh, 50 questions. People will, would kill us hmm, unless we pay them really well. Uh, but we can go deeper and we can understand uh, and also change our mind about the project. We should open, be open to that, okay? This again is difficult because we already are in love with our project uh, and changing it is painful for us. But if it turns out that we are doing a project we love and the, the users don't love or don't like or don't need, we are doing the wrong, the wrong thing. In the end, it will be you know, uh, disappointed in the final result. But we can get a lot of information. So uh, a first phase could be doing some interviews. And if you need more information, to, to, if you need to involve more people, you can also organize a survey that can reach, uh, instead of units uh, of people, five, ten, can involve hundreds or thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, surveys so, uh, are a form of more structured interviews uh, that are given or they're thought to be um, given in an unattended way. So you don't need to be there when the users uh, respond. And this is mostly for uh, online surveys or paper surveys. Sometimes you have uh, telephone surveys, okay? People that call you, can I ask you a few questions? There, it's becoming less and less popular because it's very expensive. But in those cases, you have a person that doesn't understand anything about the project, and they are just reading some questions and recording your answers. So instead of a web page, you have a person where you are less likely to close them in the middle because uh, you are going, uh, being tired. And just um, they are very cost effective. Once you set up a survey, you can disseminate it uh, uh, very widely, I would say. Uh, you can reach a very a much wider audience uh, uh, and it doesn't cost you so much okay once you set up the survey reaching a hundred or five hundred people is the same cost for you. you you just need to do a good promotion of that but then you don't you don't spend time 
uh, which is proportional uh, to the amount of people. So it pays off very easily. And uh, usually you are not expected uh, to have a long discussion or in-depth discussion about the topic. You are mainly asking from some very structured question where the, re the response will be numerical or categorical. So uh, choose one of these three uh, options and so on. And uh, so that the data, even from hundreds of users, or uh, yeah, hundreds of users can be analyzed statistically or at least visualized um, in, a, in an automatic way. So you may have your dashboard where you can see the results, okay? You're, I think you're all familiar with stuff like that, like Google Forms or whatever. Um, you are, uh, since you have only one uh, unidirectional communication, so you are sending the, the survey, but you cannot interact with the people while they're, com while they're filling it, uh, it's more, you are more blind, say, to what the user understands. So if you're talking to a person and see that the person is interpreting your question in a different way, you can correct yourself immediately. Ah, no, but I was talking about that, sorry. Sorry if I didn't explain myself very well. Uh, on sur online surveys, you, have not, you don't have this choice, so you must be very clear about what you want to know at the beginning. So the first question when setting up a survey uh, what is, what do I want to know? And then I will create some questions to get this information. And be ecological. Uh, try to minimize the effort for you and for them. In many cases, if I don't know what I want, uh, I will tend to ask everything. Okay, asking 90 questions because then I will see what comes out. No. People will not give you good information if the survey is too long and, or too boring. First, you must know, so before starting the research, you should have, write down your question. I am doing this survey because I want to know a specific part, a specific topic. And then you organize the questions around that topic or that couple of topics, but not, not more than two questions, okay? Two, let's say, kind of information. Try to first think about what, what are the statistics that are relevant for you. Too many times we find that people that first get the data, then look at the data and don't know they, what, they, what to do with those. And they rely on uh, tools that will automatically generate histograms and throw them up to their boss and say, oh, look how, how many nice histograms we have, okay? But is that information? No, it's just data garbage. So first, decide what is the format or the numbers that you want. And then you plan the questions ahead, okay? Like in software development. First, you decide what the program should compute or should output, and then you, you develop the program. It's not that you start writing lines of code because you like them, and then who knows what the program will output, something. Hmm? It's the same here. Um, in surveys, it's easy to reach a lot of people, but are these the right people? Do the information I get is uh, deep enough? Oh, this, of course, depends on the questions. But uh, uh, the risk is having a lot of uh, information, but this information will be shallow. Okay, something that we already knew. So that's, again, the importance of the question I want to ask. With a survey, I don't want to ask for some information which, is all, which would be easy to get uh, by interviewing three people. Some common information, some common knowledge. We already know that. We don't need a survey to know that uh, the sun rises in the morning. But if I have some doubt, some, some issue with my project, some really choice to make, uh, then let's focus the survey on that because it's something that we don't know yet. And maybe in our small group of interviews, we, there were contrasting opinions. 
so we need to maybe have a wider base so if we don't know which question to ask to ask or with uh, which uh, problems we want to solve or which information we want to get then what we will get is a lot a lot of uh, irrelevant information that at the end will not tell us we will not be no wiser <laughs> after the survey than we had at the beginning because we only have the same knowledge that we already have it's a problem that because we don't have it's a risk that we don't we are not able of course to ask follow-up questions so we don't have the why's we only have the what do do we like it yes or not or from one to five three but there's no one there to ask why and even if you have always at a box where you can explain more tell me why people will leave it blank 90 percent of the time so for giving their motivation it's, if it's an online survey survey the users are just expected to click here and there and not to write uh, poems on poems unless you are motivating them very well we see it with the with the you know the cpd questionnaires that you had at the end of the course okay uh, many people if we if we neg it if we neg you enough uh, send you an email and reminders and so on then maybe 60 percent of the people will take the time of filling the, uh, the, the check boxes but only 20 25 percent of those will take the time of writing something uh, in the boxes and of course uh, in that case uh, that is the most important part of feedback you know okay i can more or less guess if i'm getting a two or a three or a four in a given evaluation because okay we are not blind <laughs> okay when we are giving a course but uh, if i'm getting a, a two in some topic why is that and this is the question that i have and if people don't write it i don't know i, I it would be my guess but it's a wide guess and uh, i don't want to have my opinion i want to add other people's opinion okay so uh, this is actually impossible to get uh, and in that case for example in that case what happens if I get a, a bad score maybe I try to uh, find some of you in the corridor and say okay what do you think about this that's an informal discussion where I can get the, the qualitative information that, it, uh, that I didn't get from a quantity quantitative uh, question hmm? um, don't ask questions that are sensitive to the users okay about how many money are you uh, what is your current uh, um, earnings hmm? people um, will will be will not tell you the truth okay and uh, and you, maybe you don't care even it's just a question that you put there because you didn't know better or didn't think about better questions so uh, questions that uh, solicit the user's memory okay like uh, how often are you using this application or uh, user emotions should be left out because usually you won't get uh, um, a honest an honest answer hmm. and uh, the, the, other, the, uh, the other risk in uh, the survey is that you get more people from of course the recipients of your notification of your mails so it's very difficult to control who is going to respond in an interview I find I, I, I decide to interview 10 people I will choose two younger people two older maybe two which are more familiar and two which are more novice so that I have a sample which is more or less representative of the population not in a statistical way but in a qualitative way at least here we i don't have this control so for sure i will have some group of users that are more prone to uh, to to answer they are more willing to answer so i have a will i will have an answer rate higher in some domain and lower in some other groups of users and i need to compensate for that so if I have less answers for my group of users, I need to count these answers more. Then maybe a, a large number of answers that are all similar because they came from the same group uh, where they are. So I, we need to say, 
divide the answers according to some criteria, to some recognition of the user groups, uh, and analyze them separately. Otherwise, uh, the response will be biased towards the groups where the percentage of respondents were higher, and this is not a result you want. And uh, again, in the survey, half of the work or most of the work is in planning. Right? So when you open a survey, first of all, you should state uh, what is the purpose of the survey and what is the expected time in the first sentence. This survey will take 40 minutes. Okay, I'll close it. This question will take five minutes, but then it should be completed in five minutes, not take 15 Okay, don't lie. So at the beginning, people, uh, they are, again, investing their time, and you will tell them how much time you are, are you asking for them, and uh, why, for what purpose. And usually the questioners are uh, structured in different sections. This section asks different aspects, different points of view. Every section has one or more questions in, that, in them. And finally, you can ask for more background information about the users that will help you to uh, divide the different groups of, of responders. So about the age, not the actual age, the age group, the age range, the gender, the I know, occupation, are you a student or a teacher or whatever? And so uh, this part should be at the end of the survey, not at the beginning. So every survey where the que first question is, uh, what is your gender, what is your age? I will throw it away immediately. That is not the focus of the question, of the questioner. What do you care? I answered, if you ask me something on the topic, then I can, I can give you some more information about myself, if I want. Hmm? So always at the end, and try always to limit uh, what you are asking of, uh, about personal information. Do I really need the gender question? Does it really make a difference? For designing the door opening? So always ask yourself, is the re this information really needed? Because otherwise, it's better not to ask it, not to. No. People will be, we have some friction in, in, understand, in, re in replying to these personal questions. Okay, so only ask them if you really need them. Otherwise, they are just users. And, uh, uh, but some wide information can be asked, uh, just not, try not to be too precise or too demanding, okay? Finding which of these categories could be uh, interesting to you. Uh, for example, experience with computer. If you are developing something uh, and we want to know what is the experience of these people with uh, computer, with smartphones or whatever, or with, uh, with a specific category of software, or with a specific category of devices, that would be interesting. More interesting to know whether you are familiar with, a, I don't know, um, a smartphone, rather than asking whether you are male or female for our purposes. Okay, so try to be again, from the ecological point of view, not many questions and select only those questions that really give you insight uh, about the users. These background uh, questions help you just to identify the different groups of users. And so they will help you split the different the, the responses to the other questions, the ones about the pro, the application, the needs, and so on, according to the user group. Hmm? Again, if we did a good analysis of the possible user groups, uh, it would be easier just to have a, ask a couple of questions that will help us to put every response into the uh, right group. Um, again, we may have open-ended or closed-ended questions. 
in questions, uh, the closed end questions are much more frequent because it's easier. They are uh, it's they are easier to to process, uh, to extract information, to do statistics, and so on. Um, the open-ended questions uh, are more less likely to be filled. You already said that uh, if we have an open field, people would spend more, need to spend more time and often they will write short sentences or, or nothing at all. Uh, but if, you, if they write something, uh, how do I process that? If I have 200 responses of a three or four, four line text, how do I process it? I can read all of them, but at the end, how can I summarize the information? So there are methods for doing that. There are methods for taking these answers and trying to extract some synthesis uh, in, from, from all the text. Okay? We, we won't uh, spend time in that, but if, if you do that, uh, just don't. You can read everything and make, uh, you know, make yourself an idea. So, oh, it's okay, I wrote all of this, and now I have a better understanding, but it would be better just to apply one of these methods uh, usually you have to mark outline words uh, find synonyms and so uh, find uh, trends in what the people are saying okay method of text, text analysis method or just we rely on closed ended questions where uh, you, people have to give answers by selecting one choice or a group of choices from a scale or from a range of possibilities and these possibilities could be Ordinal values, so values that can be sorted from the smallest to the largest. One star, two star, three stars. Good, bad, not too bad. Or nominal values. The nominal values are alternatives that don't have any sorting. Male, female, there's no sorting order defined. Uh, where do you live? Italy, France, Spain. Okay, you can put them into an alphabetical order just to make them easier to find, but uh, there's no, you, have, you don't have more points uh, in selecting one choice over the other. So you, for nominal values, you cannot do any average. You cannot do any thresholding and any type of numerical analysis rather than just uh, analyzing the distribution. When you have ordinal values, of course, you can do more, let's say, numerical statistics. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have some examples mm -hmm. of this case, uh, the type of case uh, for which you are asking an answer. So uh, okay, the, the nominal scale is the easiest one. You have a number of possibilities. You may choose one. And these possibilities are all possibly alternative and mutually ex exclusive but there is no order in between them okay what you can what can you do at the end with the response in a, of a nominal value is just counting them i have 70% uh, of males and 30% of females that responded or 80% from italy and 20% from abroad that's it you can count frequencies okay in an ordinal case, uh, you have distinct classes uh, where it, there is some predefined order. Uh, do you agree with this statement? I totally agree. I partially agree. I don't agree. I don't agree at all, for example. No? Many questions are put like this. Um, so we have an order, but we don't have a distance between. Is uh, the distance between I totally agree and I agree longer or shorter, if this means anything, from the distance between I don't agree and I totally don't agree? We, we cannot ask this question. So we, this class could be one, two, uh, encoded a like number like one, two, three, four, or one star, two star, three stars, and so on. But the distance between four and five stars is not the same as the distance, semantic difference uh, between three and four stars. 
these, these are not numbers, are steps in a staircase where the steps are not even, are not all the same. And, not, and they are not the same for each of us. So we know that 4 is better than 3. But we cannot say that the amount for which 4 is better than 3 will be the same as the amount for which 3 is better than 2. What does this lead to? This leads to the fact that some kind of statistics that rely on distances cannot be used in ordinal values. For example, the notion of the average cannot be defined on an ordinal set of values. So if you have the five stars and they're telling you that this topic got, in average, 3.5 stars, I'm cheating. Because in doing a statistical measures, measure over a quantity that doesn't allow to define an average mathematically huh? because making an average means uh, minimizing the distance between the items and the value of the average so we are making we are computing differences and making this difference to zero and since these items don't have any distance defined we are just faking it okay so even the average of your, of your scores that you have uh, in the libretto electronic okay you have 29.7 that, that's fake because uh, exam scores are not numbers they are just levels okay and you know that because you know that getting a 28 with that professor is much harder than getting a 30 with that other professor and getting a that professor only gives 28 and will never give 30 except in, in, in a, uh, exceptional cases. So the difference between a score and another is very dependent on the context. So you cannot just put all the numbers together and do a sum. We do that, we know it's wrong. Okay? So let's be careful also when we analyze the numbers. Uh, we should, in order to be able to uh, do means uh, and averages and various analyses, uh, we, should be able, we should be sure that the numbers we collect uh, can be really treated as numbers, not as levels. Okay? And uh, in our surveys, we see this is very rarely the case, where we have actual num numbers would be measurements. Uh, how tall are you? This is a number, of course. Uh, what is the distance? Okay, uh, how many kilometers uh, you uh, drive every day? That is a number. And so we can analyze them. But many, in many other cases, when you have questions about scoring, about grading, about ordering, they are not really numbers. So what we could do is just uh, ordering, doing statistics, countings, computing mid, the median value, the quartiles, the percentiles, and so on, ranking them, but not uh, uh, computing averages or, of, or distribution and so on. Mm. This, of course, there would be a lot of, uh, say, statistics there if you want to understand which is the best way of analyzing some, some data sets. Uh, practically, a lot of people are using uh, um, the so-called uh, Likert scales. Likert is the name of a person that just formalized the thing, uh, which are four-level or five-level scales uh, where people are giving different options and uh, when we know that uh, there is an ordering of uh, preference between those, uh, but let's not try to do many computations of these numbers that we can get from there. Okay, I will uh, uh, stop here, of course, because the time is over. Uh, we, the first, the group of the, uh, the people of the first group, we can go to, to the lab. We do. It seems that it, like the, the exit here is open from the from the garden, so we don't need to walk uh, from inside. Um, and next time we'll do some practical exercise where we'll try to plan together some interview and or some survey uh, so that just to have some uh, exercise about this topic. <laughs>